welcome everybody to this uh, Clifton conversation. I am particularly excited about this one because this is our first author conversation. Um, before we begin, of course, I want to acknowledge that Clifton um, School of Arts is on Darawal country, which is the traditional lands of the Wadi Wadi people. And I want to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And I am also on Darawal country. And so is Helena Fox, our guest today. So um, one of the things that I really love about how these conversations are evolving is the way, like a sort of series of Chinese whispers, someone mentions someone to someone and then, you know, it all kind of happens. And I just want to acknowledge that it was um, Kristin, uh, Kirsten Bokor, John Bokor's wife. We spoke to John Bokor a few weeks ago, but Kirsten uh, put me in touch with Helena. Uh, Helena, God, I'm going to start doing it now. Sorry. Um, and I just love that kind of continuity that we're getting through this series. So um, I just wanted to share that with everybody and say thank you to Kirsten. Um, so as I mentioned, um, Helena is joining us today from her home in Russell Vale. She's actually got some of her writing students with her. They've been doing a workshop today. Uh, and so I want to welcome those students as well. Helena has lived for 20 years in the northern Illawarra and so actually that's particularly nice to know because it means that this is where she wrote This is How It Feels to Float, for which she won the Victorian Premier's Literary Award for Young Adult Fiction. And the book, just to give it another layer of sort of local connection, was actually launched last year at Clifton School of Arts by Margot Lanigan. So that's a very nice way to kind of join us all up together. This is How It Feels to Float is a tender story of adolescent vulnerability, loss, grief and identity, full of moments that will have you laughing one moment and crying the next. It may be designated as young adult fiction, but I loved reading it as an adult and it gave me so much insight into adolescent pain and imagination. And if you're a parent or a grandparent, an aunt, an uncle or a godparent, you'll get a lot of insight, I think, into adolescent uh, ways of thinking from this novel. So um, welcome, Helena and your students, but most especially you. It's lovely to have you with us today. Thank you. Um, I wanted to start by asking you, um, I know that you've lived here for 20 years, but um, you led a pretty sort of nomadic life before that, mm. and you actually grew up somewhere very exotic. So can you tell us um, where you were born and where you grew up and what language you grew up speaking? Um, well, I grew up probably in four or five different countries once you start from birth to when I finally came to Australia at about the age of 11 or 12. Um, but I started off in Peru and so Spanish was my first language and then uh, when I was about four we went to Spain and I lived in Barcelona um, for a bit and then we went to England and I lived uh, just west of London where I first learnt English and I got my English accent <laughs> um, <laughs> and then we popped over to Australia when I was eight and then my mum promptly got a job in Samoa and so we went and lived in Samoa for a while and I didn't return I didn't really land in Australia till I was um, in year six and so I came uh, to primary school with my odd accent and my odd ways um, we didn't in one of the places we lived in in Samoa, we didn't have hot water and um, we didn't have a TV and we didn't have, you know, it just, it wasn't primitive by any stretch of the imagination, but it was different. And, um, and so I then landed in the suburbs of, you know, of Sydney and tried to assimilate and it was quite difficult. So um, yeah, and then when I was 21, I started traveling again and then moved over to the States when I was 24 and lived there for a long time. And so just, 
Yeah. Jumping forward, I mean, I'm interested in the fact that um, uh, you're a young adult writer, or you're categorised that way, and your book is kind of categorised that way. Mm-hmm. I'm just interested in when the idea of becoming a writer first sort of um, came into your mind, because your parents had a very interesting role. They were actually running an anti-Vietnam War newspaper at one stage in yeah. California, you were telling me, and I think that they had a little bit of contact there with the Black Panthers, and it doesn't really yeah. get much cooler than that in my book. Um, So were your parents um, interested in writing and journalism and is that where you get your interest from? Um, Well my dad uh, was massively read like he grew up um, he had an illness when he was young where he was had to stay at home a lot um, and was bedridden for a while and so he did a lot of reading and he our house was just filled with books and so part of that was my dad and my mum was um she was a history buff she was incredibly well read as well and she was um uh she was an editor so she has a so she was working as an editor and as an educator so she's been a senior editor and a senior lecturer um at university of Wollongong and so um just a lot of books, <laughs> a lot of books in my, in my childhood home. And um, some of which I read that I probably shouldn't have read because I was given <laughs> free access to many books. So I remember, I think, finding some books that, you know, Charles Bukowski and um, I think uh, there's one that's the, the Collector by um, where there was a woman, trapped in a, yeah, woman trapped in a basement. I read that when I was 12. <laughs> We should have read that. Um, and my dad was a graphic designer and a poet as well. Um, he didn't get published, but he was writing poetry um, the whole time that I um, that I knew him. And so it was just a very kind of a life of going to sleep, listening to classical music and books all over the shelves, and like the whole downstairs bookshelf area was all my dad's science fiction novels. <laughs> So I, um, and when I, when I learned English, and I said this actually in my um, speech in when I won the Victorian Prize, was um, that my introduction to the English language really came through books. It was um, how I learned my, this is how kind of the language came alive for me and how I felt welcomed by it was through story. And so um, I just kind of careened in, into and through books. Like I, that's yeah. some of my earliest memories is sitting at my special desk, doing my homework, reading and reading and reading. And I remember being um, about seven or eight and writing my first chapter book and just loving it. And I actually dug up my old diaries, um, which I started writing, I think when I was about 12 or 13 and I was having a look through, you know, these oh I love so and so and oh you know (laughs) a lot of you know tortured poetry and but there was a lot of oh I'd love to write one day and one day you know when I'm a writer and so it was interesting how I then chose to study law which was (laughs) only because I got marks to get in and I thought oh I should study law because I got the marks and so it took me till I was I was 24 and I just graduated with a law degree and I was about to head into a life of family law actually when I realized it was absolutely not what I wanted and cuz I knew it was going to suck me in <laughs> And I wouldn't, I would probably get spat out quite quickly. Um, You sound to me from the way you're describing the fact that you obviously had a very rich imaginative life and you were sort of soaking up books like, you know, blotting paper and, you know, writing in your journal. Are you an only child? No, I I have a sister. (laughs) Yeah. So no, my sister and I, um, yeah, like we're very close and she's, she's an artist and she, I I think I just, um, we had a very tumultuous life. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't really steady and it was quite um, chaotic and sometimes quite traumatic. And so I think I went into books as a refuge Mm. a lot. Mm. And um, just so while I do have obviously memories of my whole family and, you know, us having adventures and things, um, my safe space was books. And so, 
let's um since since um you know uh, we're here to talk about um how it feels to float as well as about you let's have a look at the book trailer this is something we've not done before but um let's see whether we can play it since you've supplied it to us um uh, my producer is going to press play now <laughs> my thoughts are running away the things that held me together are coming undone my mind drifts, slips. I float and fall into the sky. I was going to ask you about place in How It Feels to Float because Biz, the narrator, yeah. um, uh, sums up where she lives very neatly at the beginning of the book. And she says, I'm just going to read a couple of lines. The city sits beside the sea under an escarpment. The sea pushes at the shore, shoving under rocks and dunes and lovers. Craggy cliffs lean over us, trying to read what we've written. The city is long like a finger. It was a steel town once. There, that's the tour. And then she says a little bit later on, um, I can walk to school in 15 minutes or I can walk straight past it and go to the sea. Or if I want to be a total rebel, I can go the opposite direction and in 15 minutes end up in a rainforest under a mountain gathering leeches for my leech army, which doesn't sound very appealing to me. But um, just tell me a little bit about writing this book in this place where you live. Why was that important to you? Um, well, one of the lovely, one of the delights of having this be my first book that got published was that I've written other books before. I've, I've got novel manuscripts and short story collections, you know, sitting in drawers and things. And um, one of the things I'd never, there were two things I hadn't tried before, um, was one was writing um, entirely from the point of view of one character. And the other thing was to write very securely in place. So before that, I'd been writing um, short stories and things in invented places and multiple perspectives, um, very much a fragmentary kind of short story thinker. Um, but what I do love about starting any new project is giving myself a challenge. And so I thought it was kind of nice to kind of hook this project onto two main challenges and one was okay I'm going to try and stick to one point of view and the other thing which I veer off a little because I do have um, stories from photographs but um, the other one was to write in place and once I knew I wanted to write in place I was like hmm, I wonder where I should write it and then I was like here I'm going to write it here and there was something so lovely and warm about that feeling of like, oh, like I, I realized that I had a book that I wanted to write. Um, the realization came to me at Bullard Beach Cafe. Like it could have been a more perfect like epiphany moment. I had all these um, pieces that I'd been writing for a while. And there was this moment where I, I was sitting at the cafe with my daughter I just on impulse pulled out this old file that I'd had for years that I'd been putting things into and I read all those short pieces, realized they were all from the same voice, realized that I had a book that I really wanted to write. And it was this incredible, and I remember where I was sitting, I remember looking out at the sea. And I think in a way it was like this, the, the setting walked in and sat down just as much as Biz walked in and sat yeah. down and said, here I am, write about us. So yeah. then it became um, this whole extra element that I didn't expect, like when I got to write about the, the night markets, you know, Eat Street markets, and I got to write about Seacliff Bridge, and I got to write about um, going down the South Coast and just so many things that, while my character was going through such a difficult time, it was in a way a little love letter to her home because pretty much anything past the sea and she thought of it as foreign. So I know that I have um, a line where it's her friend moves to Wagga and she says that's so far away from the sea, it may as well be imaginary. Yes. And so when she does go inland, she's uh, completely out of her element. She's already having a very tough time with her mental health and, so this poor town that I picked 
<laughs> as the inland town, I keep, I keep wanting to go to tomorrow and say, I'm so sorry, this is not me. <laughs> this is a very lost and confused 17-year-old um, girl experiencing life very much away from her comfort space. So it was really nice to kind of to write about my town that I've adopted in a way because I'd never had a town. I'd never really belonged anywhere. I have to so, tell you that I think it's a really special experience for a reader to read a book that is set somewhere that they recognize with their everyday landmarks. And I felt that very much reading this in the same way that I did when I was reading Catherine McKinnon's wonderful Storyland. You know, there's just such a kind of uh, extra level of pleasure in the recognition of places that you may have walked past or walked in. You mentioned Bulai um, Cafe as a place that you write. So obviously you don't have to be sequestered at home in your own writing room. You can write yeah. in public places. And this is, you know, I said, I think when I was um, previewing that you were going to be on, I told our audience members that um, your writing reminds me of Sophie Laguna and Sophie Laguna can write in her car, which I think is just completely astonishing. Not while she's driving, but you know. <laughs> well, I mean, don't laugh. There, there is a writer that I've interviewed, a Tasmanian writer that I've interviewed, who does actually dictate oh in gosh. her recording machine while she's driving. Um, oh, no, no I, I mean, <laughs> Laguna can sit parked outside school before pickup. And, and she can write there. So where else in and around the Northern Illawarra could we see you writing? Well, nowhere right now because I am in, I am so sequestered now that I haven't been to a cafe in a long time. You might see me. I haven't been writing anywhere but this little room for six months or five months, however long lockdown's been happening. So it's very odd for me to be writing there's something sometimes I go, oh, I have to go back. I'm so lucky. I've got this beautiful room that I get to write in. And sometimes I'm like, oh, <laughs> I have to go to my writing room because I just, um, let's take off the COVID land. You know, if we were in non-COVID land, you'd see me at Bulleye Beach Cafe. You'd see me on the train going up to Sydney a lot. You'd right. see the, right. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Um, Wollongong uh, Uni Library, I really love writing in. I've written at Thoreau Library. I've written... I find that um, too noisy. How do you do that? I actually really like the hum of life all around me. I love the sense of just... Um, I don't know. I think in a way it's just... I can get... Um, weirdly I can get distracted and for some reason um like in my own room I'm like ah oh, there's something maybe there's something else to do maybe I should oh, look at sure. the internet oh, yes. or I should go have a cup of tea oh maybe what does the dog need whereas when I'm in a coffee shop um I've pl I've rented that table essentially with the co with my hot chocolate I've paid rent on that on that table and I haven't got wi-fi and I have and so there's like um just I don't know it's almost like I'm cocooned in this in this lovely space of like um just companionship and people yeah, are I love that because it removes a sort of layer of preciousness I think from the whole thing and makes it yeah. sort of kind of connect more into the real world I got the sense that your own experience of school was quite difficult because you were different and that you were bullied at school and biz is interesting because she belongs to a posse which is kind of a quite tight-knit little group that she hangs out with but um then she finds herself ostracized and on the outside of it and i'm just wondering whether you think that um there is so much more rich material to write about in terms of the complexities that social media and texting, which you use in the book, you know, there's lots of messaging between uh, Biz and Grace, her best friend, and then a, another new wonderful friend who presents himself on the scene. So, so when you look at all of the things from your own childhood that you had to deal with in terms of bullying and being different, and then you look at what's happening for adolescents today, do you think there are key differences now around things like slut shaming? Um, 
I think there's just, it just comes in a new form perhaps. I think technology has made it that maybe you can't escape that when you get home um, in the way that perhaps you could a little more when there weren't cell phones and there weren't, um, you know, all the different forms of messaging and sharing. I think um, from what I understand, you know, you can have a really tough time you head home to your safe space and then you look online or you look at messages and, and I know that terrible, you know, hurtful things can be said and shared um, 24 hours a day. And so I think that's where things are. I think I remember very clearly there being a lot of shaming um, in school when I was in school, but I think I remember I would head home um, and I just get, I'd fall into my books and I'd ride my bike up and down the street with the yeah, cul-de-sac, you know, and, and yeah, and I don't know that it's as clear that there is a sanctuary at home. Maybe I know that people can go, oh, just put your phone away, etc. But it's not that simple when that's really the way that people, a lot of people communicate. And um, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't meant to be a, a, a slam on you know, the way that we, that young people communicate or necessarily a, a slam of school, you know, school is bad or anything like that. It was just more, it's complicated. And it's, and I don't think you're doing that at all, but I think you're showing that tribes are kind of very changeable sort of, um, um, you know, ever changing forms and, and they regroup and they become a different kind of, shape of tribe and where they might be benign one moment they become yeah. hostile the next and i'm interested in that because i think somewhere i read that you describe yourself as a kindness ninja <laughs> and i was just wondering what it is about kindness that interests you as a writer i can understand what interests you about kindness as a human being because we all need it we need more of it than ever um, we're living in a very polarized, sort of fragmented, very angry world at the moment. But can you just talk about write, writing and kindness? I was going through a, a very difficult time myself with my mental health as I was writing this book. And um, I almost got to the end of it, of, the, of that, of the main finished book and went, it's almost like I woke up and went, oh my goodness, I wrote a book. And so a lot of the things that happened in the book just it was almost like I was following, um, almost just, just almost doing it intuitively, just going, okay, I think we'd go here and I think this would happen. And, um, and so I think a lot of the things that saved me and a lot of the things that helped me through not just that difficult time, but many other difficult times in, in, in the past were, acts of kindness by my mental health carers, by my health carers, by my family, by my friends. I have a safety net of, of people who, um, who look out for me, just um, who I knew that at any moment I could contact and they'd be there um, with support. And so um, for me, as I, when I first kind of started to work with biz and write her story i had this enormous urge that i think is based on my urge to be compassionate as much as i possibly can every day i think i genuinely do in this possibly the cheesiest way um i think what's the kindest thing that i can do today and so i try and, and do that um and so when I first kind of met biz i thought i want you to be okay i want you to be safe and so a lot of the story choices I made were steering her, you know, definitely no one could say that she has an easy time of it no, um, or so that funny. her history is in any way comfortable. It's, uh, she's dealing with some tremendous trauma. She but has every, guardian angels. Yeah. I think I just, I planted them for her in the way that um, guardian angels or carers have come for me and I also invented people I would have loved to have in my corner um, at that age you know I, I had you know when you're you know I don't know that there was as much understanding of mental health issues um, when I was growing up so I kind of did have to travel a lot of that path 
um, without the support that now I would want young people to have. This and so I, I think the choice in my writing is offering offering the things that I might have liked to have as a young person, offering um, sources of support, offering hope. So it's just but, almost unconscious. I, I, I don't want to ask you for details about, about that, but I'm very struck in hearing you talk, Elena, about something that I remember when um, I interviewed Jonathan Franson, uh, when um, the corrections came out. And um, he talked about his depression in a way that I've never forgotten. He talked about his depression being the sponsor of his writing. Oh, it was the most brilliant phrase. And I suspect that there are a lot of authors who suffer from mm. uh, a mild form of depression or a high functioning kind of depression um, or various other mental health issues, but where um, that can actually be the fuel to write a story that is different. And so what you've done in a way is you've given Biz all the help and all the support that she needs so that in the end, having floated, she can come in and land safely. Yeah, and I think I also wanted to paint a realistic picture of someone at the beginning of that journey because um, one of the things that I've come to realize is that it's an ongoing process, you know, living with mental health issues. I, I, I don't want to, like it's, I've come to accept it so much that I, it's something I live with. And so um, I don't think of it as me. I don't, I don't know that I would think of depression as my sponsor so much as a thing I carry and I, a thing that I live with. So I think a lot of the, you know, that short story, the things they carried, and I just think of it as a thing I carry. And um, when you say the word carry, I think that's why we use the term emotional baggage, because it is like you've got yeah. sort of a little suitcase that you carry <laughs> around with you, isn't it? Yeah. And um, I, I, wanted, I wanted Biz to get to a place where she could maybe understand that it was something she was going to carry but that wasn't going to be um necessarily a burden that wasn't well it it was going to be challenging but it wasn't going to define her and it wasn't going to necessarily have to limit her she was going to find the tools and start building a, a path for herself with her her lovely lovely friends and oh my gosh like i know i wrote the book but there, there's still moments where i read the, la the last parts and just go and I remember that feeling that electric feeling of hope of like oh let's just keep on shall we like let's <laughs> as long as we can you know and I have to re I remind myself of that on a difficult day it's like well let's just keep on maybe just one you know let's just get through today or let's and actually get... you know ironically that is one of the lessons isn't it of lockdown yeah. i mean there are many lessons of lockdown but one of them is we can't plan we have to live entirely and only for today because we have no idea what's going to happen tomorrow it's it's difficult in some ways but i think a lot of us now are getting used to just completely abandoning any sort of yeah. notion of control um there's a word that I really love that I read very early on in the COVID thing, and that's radical acceptance. And I just feel that a lot of um, a, like radical acceptance, radical kindness, radical generosity, it's just, it, you have to almost be extreme with your acceptance so that you can travel, keep traveling, because it's like, um, if you're fighting, if you're constantly fighting, I don't want this, I don't want to feel this, this is too hard, this is too awful. It's not to say, oh yes, I accept um, that terrible things are happening and I'm just going to lie down and take it. It's more, I accept that this is happening, I'm going to keep on going. I accept that this is happening, I'm going to keep on going, rather than wishing bad things away. Sometimes it takes just going, oh yes, this is happening let's live inside that and so for me it's like okay i'm not going to get to hug my mum for five months but i get to talk to her on zoom you know <laughs> or you know i don't get to i don't get to do this i also but i do get to do this you yeah, know exactly. yeah 
as as indeed we have been lucky to talk to you today on zoom we've come to the end of our half hour we don't have any questions but we have come to the end of the time that we've got together um, thank you so much for kind of sharing this afternoon with us and thank you to your students also for sharing you with us um, there's a there's an extraordinarily lovely kind of segue in the fact that um, biz uh, finds a great deal of pleasure in learning how to take photographs yeah. and um, and funnily enough the next Clif Clifton conversation in two weeks time is with an internationally acclaimed photographer called Stephen Dupont who travels the world documenting humanitarian crises, environmental problems and war zones and he comes home to his sanctuary in Scarborough and so we will be talking to him in two weeks time. Um, Helena thank you again very much. Um, we will have uh, Stephen Dupont in two weeks with some pictures and look forward to seeing you back here then and in the meantime uh, live in the moment as Helena and, uh, and Biz have learnt to do and stay warm and stay well. Thank you. Thanks Caroline.